everyone one interviews, one has to be very careful how one describes them, whether they're still Conservatives or not Conservatives, still in the government or in the government. So that, I mean, I get this sense that there is this great mood of uncertainty about what, quite where we're heading uh, at this conference. Would you agree? Well, look, politics is very uncertain at the moment, but actually the one thing that I think is very clear about this conference, if you look at our main conference messaging about getting Brexit done, there's a massive amount of unity about that. And it is genuinely what people on the doorsteps think. I mean, I've been going out campaigning in my constituency, and there's a real sense that whichever side they voted, people want to get out of the European Union, and then they want politics. They get that we're going to be talking about Europe for a long period of time as we get that future relationship. But they do actually want politics to get back to talking about Brexit and everything else, not just about Brexit. So when you do interviews, yes, you ask a question about Brexit, but you don't ask 48 questions about Brexit. It's Brexit plus all the other things. And that's, I think, where everyone wants to get to. But in a sense, the problem with the slogan getting Brexit done, it's a bit like Brexit is Brexit. I mean, mm. getting Brexit done doesn't necessarily mean that there's... Yes, everyone would like to stop talking about Brexit, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean they back a no-deal Brexit, does it? Well, I think it means they back let's, getting out of the European Union. Everyone recognises that whether you leave with a withdrawal agreement or without one, you're still going to be talking to our European Union partners. But the point is it doesn't then become the only thing we're talking about. It becomes one of the important issues of the day and some days it will be more important than others but it means we get to talk yeah. about investing in the health service you know the things the chancellor's talking about today investing in if i take my constituents they're much more interested in what are we putting in roads getting them fast broadband to their homes you know making sure we level up education funding that's what actually people want us to but spend I mean, our these time things are all, are all tied up aren't they a because brexit presumably is going to have some sort of economic impact mm. which is going to affect how much money there is uh, available up or down for public services but the, i mean the other aspect is you know it's a terrible indictment of the conservatives that the party that delivered the you know had the referendum yep. said it would honor it and three and a half years later it hasn't honored it and yet it's saying to the public support us so we can honor something that we've been in power for three and a half years we haven't been able to do no, no, that's a perfectly fair point in one way, but the point I would make is that the vast majority of Conservative MPs did what they said they would do two years ago at the 2017 election, which is back getting out of the European Union. Every time you get an opposition MP turn up on your programme yeah. saying, oh, I'm really worried about a no-deal Brexit, they've never voted for a deal yeah, you to get know, us out of the European the Union, and they're you, not going to no, either. You know the reason why we're not out now is because of your Conservative colleagues that had the European Research Group voted for Mrs May's deal at any stage, it would have passed and we would have left. Well, no, actually, even on the 29th of March, even if every one of them had voted for it, there was still actually a number of colleagues who, who want a second referendum or something else, so that still wouldn't have worked. So, th look, this is a difficult issue. I, I'm backing the Prime Minister to go to that European Council meeting. I, I still think there's a window to get a deal, and we've seen some of the shape of that emerging with some of the conversations about how you're going to deal with the Irish border. If he can bring that back, I think he can get that through, but you do. the problem... I mean, yeah, I mean you're actually, no, well, you counted the do, numbers. I do, but, think... I, but I think it will be very tight, and, and one of the things I think that will be necessary is we will need some Labour MPs to vote for it. The Labour front bench are never going to vote for it, and one of my worries about the Surrender Act yeah. is that it stops... It's a, well, no, but look, you, you pull a face, but it is an accurate reading. I mean, I went away and looked at this, and I've been through it in great deal. It does give away our negotiating position. It means the Prime Minister would have to ask for an extension. Whatever conditions the EU comes back with, he has to sign up for them. And I just think that's an appalling way of trying to get a deal. And if we're going to get it through Parliament, we need to be able to say to those Labour MPs from leave areas, it's either this deal or we're leaving without one, because otherwise they're just, so going, you, to kick the, they're just going to kick the can down. You're saying you think the effect of the Ben Act is to surrender to the EU. That's what you're saying. Yeah, it hands over the... Uh, the fact that it forces the Prime Minister to have to do something. But worse, it's that if they come back with an offer of an extension, they can wrap a whole load of conditions around it, and it gives us no ability to say no. He just has to sign up for it. And I just think yeah. giving that level of power away to the EU is unconscionable. And, that and that's is, why he made a confidence vote, yeah. and why but he, there were consequences for Conservatives said, and He could have said, I might, you know, if I don't get a deal, I might ask for an extension myself, and then he wouldn't have been subject to those conditions. Yeah, but he's been very clear. He wants to, as I say, yeah. get Brexit done. And I yeah. think that is the mood of the public. And by the way, even from businesses now, yeah. 
even if leaving without a withdrawal agreement is not their first choice. There's a real cost to businesses about the uncertainty, about not knowing whether we are or aren't leaving. Most businesses have now made plans yeah. for leaving with a deal. They've made plans about leaving without a withdrawal agreement, but they just want to know what the position is. And just kicking the can down the road has a real financial cost for businesses, both in terms of investment and jobs. Do you think... Do you think um that Boris Johnson really knows what he's doing. I mean, he seems to have farmed out an awful lot to this unelected uh, bloke called Dominic Cummings. No, I think he does. I've been watching very closely some of the uh, the stuff that we publish, those non-papers, you know, those proposals yeah, yeah. we put, put out to the EU. And I can see the shape of something emerging where you get rid of the backstop, but you look at having that common uh, agri-food zone, um, yeah. the, the sanitary, well, frontier the sanitary thing. Europe I can see the shape of something but emerging. the European Union is saying they've seen it all before and they've rejected it in the past. Yeah, but, but to be honest, they are going to say that until we get to the end game and we're going to have a couple, after this conference, we're going to have a couple of weeks yeah. before that European Council and I think there's going to be some really intensive work on both but sides. But you've got this conflict that, get to that a lot of people here will quite happily say... We want to get out anyway. Why are we bothering to negotiate? They're all, they're all being unreasonable. And, you know, I, I can't see how you can marry those within the Conservative well, Party Well, it's going to be anymore. a test, not just for us, but for our European Union partners. I think if Boris Johnson, as I believe he's doing, is really serious over the next couple of weeks, really tries to get a deal, and ultimately the EU just comes back and says, no, we're not prepared to move yeah. one iota, then I think the country will... will back him and say, look, they're being very unreasonable. Um, so it's a choice for them as well. And I think for the fifth largest economy, largest defence power in Europe, um, a real powerhouse behind delivering security to the country, to the continent, I can't believe that the EU really wants to have a ruptured relationship with us over the next few years. I think it's in their interest to come to an arrangement with us, and I hope they do that over the coming weeks. Well, yeah, what do you think the chances are that he won't be Prime Minister by the end of October? I mean, it looks as if there is a majority to defeat him in a vote of confidence. Well, no, I, I don't believe that, actually, because I think the, that people have to ask themselves about what would come next, and I think there is no majority for Jeremy Corbyn to become Prime Minister. Labour are never going to agree to support somebody else, and I don't well, think... Well, I, I, well I, I don't think there's any chance that they'll support anybody else. And I know from having talked to a number of them, those of my Conservative colleagues who've lost the whip but who are still members of the Conservative Party. And I remember what Philip Howard said. He said he'd rather boil his head than see Jeremy, I think that's what he said, yeah. than see Jeremy Corbyn go into Downing Street. And I think we saw at their conference last week their unlimited immigration literally let everyone into this country and use our National Health Service. The policies we saw at the weekend on welfare, which was, you know, let people have unlimited sized families paid for by the taxpayer, not cap the amount people can get on benefits. Those policies are going to go down but, but, really but, but, badly with people uh, at home. That, I, mean, I don't see any support we, for that at all. That's when and if we get to an election, and of course there will have to be one one day, but in the interim, this possibility of having a caretaker government... Uh, yeah, but you see, that's the flaw, because the way the fixed-term parliaments act work, if people get rid of the present yeah. government and install yeah. Jeremy Corbyn, they might be stuck with him for a very long period of time. Because well, once yeah. he's installed, yeah. then there's no guarantee you're going to get rid of him. A, a, well... Until the next well, election. Well, there are two faults with that. One is he, he might give a commitment and actually honour his word, that he, he, which is what he said so far, or someone else, that they would only do it as far as seeking extension and having a general election or a referendum or whatever they decided. The other thing, of course, is that clearly any caretaker government, given the mass, would be extremely fragile. So at any point... There could be a vote of confidence in it, and that way, and, and to bring it down. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily uh, get uh, Jeremy Corbyn forever, even if he emerges. Well, I, but I don't think there are because the, the Lib Dems would pull the plug. But I don't think Conservative to. colleagues, and actually, I don't think the Liberal Democrats are going to back him to become Prime Minister. So I think Boris well, Johnson. I know, but I'm just saying it, well, I think you Boris wouldn't Johnson, be stuck with him forever. That's well, I think I'm Boris saying. Johnson will still be the Prime Minister. He'll go to the European Council, and I think he'll fight very hard for a good deal for Britain. And I think, frankly, the public will be behind him. Certainly, the party is behind him. Certainly, if my constituents that I talk to are any test, I think the public will want him to go to that uh, European Council and, and be successful. 